Is it irrational to have a huge collection of vintage scents? Yeah, it is pretty irrational. There's a bit of magic in these vintage designs that are, is difficult to recreate with modern components, but it's not impossible or you can get very, very close. System 80 is really about uh, re recreating vintage analog designs to make them available to people. Uh, because, you know, an 808 on the second hand market is now $4,000 or something like that. So it's really the idea to say, well, a lot of these parts, especially some of the vintage Japanese transistors, they're all available in contemporary packages for uh, modern manufacturing. So it's just a matter of being determined to source them and then faithfully recreating the circuits and you get very close. So that's really the, my main motivation is to make these sounds and synthesis methods available to people that want them without having to go and build a vintage studio. So System 80 got started uh, because I had designed a Jupiter 6 filter. So I designed a multi-mode filter that's a clone of the filter in Jupiter 6. The clone is maybe a bit of an exaggeration. It's in inspired by uh, the Jupiter 6 filter. Um, which has its own really unique sound that's quite distinct from the, the other Roland filters of that era. I got started by making uh, five units by hand and just selling them locally. Uh, and I got a lot of really good feedback. And the people that bought them were serious, in my view, like very serious and experienced synthesists in the Toronto scene. So when they came back to me and said, oh, we really love this filter that you've made, you know, you should release this commercially. It was really at their encouragement. And that was what led to Jove. So that's the System 80 Jupiter 6 filter. It uh, has been really well received, it's sold well, and that was sort of the foundation on which System 80 was formed. I quit my day job about six or seven years ago. I was a molecular cell biologist for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, eventually became more interested in synths than I was in molecular biology. I had quit this job being a research scientist. It was kind of weird to just not go to work anymore and use my brain. I needed something to do. There is still a lot of mental bandwidth left over after the kids are taken care of. And so I put that bandwidth into design. It's nice to just come into the studio and, and sit down and, and, and design something and build it. The original reason why I put together my big analog studio was to, to make music. So I used to write music as mini system. And I released uh, music that was sort of, you know, techno pop, I guess you could say. It was fairly melodic. It was all analog drums, 808, 909, CR78, and then analog bass lines like uh, Roland System 100, uh, Mini Moog, and then, uh, you know, Polysynths. So Jupiter 6 featured heavily on a lot of my, my Mini System records. How did I go from being an enthusiastic vintage synth owner and collector to uh, doing design work. By this time I'd stopped actively making music and so it didn't make sense to go out and spend thousands of dollars to acquire my dream top of the line analog polysynth. So I started looking into designing my own. I started diving under the hood of the Prophet 600 and the service manual for the Prophet 600 is amazing. There's so much detail about how the synth works, 
how the microprocessor interfaces with the analog circuitry. There's just paragraphs about all the tips and tricks that the designers used to make the, the rudimentary circuits at the time work, like the limited uh, ability of the processor that was used. I learned about how a polysynth is made, how does programmability work. All of that really was gleaned from the Prophet 600 service manual, which is really well written. And the Prophet 600, if I remember correctly, really was his synth. Like Dave sat down and designed the whole thing from beginning to end by himself. It wasn't a team of engineers, a sequential, it was just Dave. And I think he also wrote the firmware for it as well. When you look in that synth and you see some of the clever shortcuts and tricks that he used, there's a lot to learn and there's a lot of uh, really clever things that are going on in that synth. Uh, so the Prophet 600 and Dave Smith, the, its designer, really inspired me. I was doing repair work for friends, uh, and just by coincidence, I had three people in a row bring me their 808s for repair. And so I fixed them uh, and got poking around in them. And when I was doing the repair, I was like, oh, you know, these are these some, these circuits are pretty simple. So. I started to research uh, some of the out of production parts. Were they still available? Maybe they were available in modern surface mount components as opposed to the through hole components that all the vintage gear uses. And sure enough, the vast majority of parts in, in the Neo808 were all that they were available still in full production uh, in surface mount versions. I was like, oh, I've got a couple of weeks off over Christmas. Let's see if I can capture the schematic and let's see if I can fit it, like make it as, as small as possible um, and see if I can fit it into a Eurorack module. It became a design challenge. Can I squeeze all of the circuitry of an 808 into a Eurorack module that still has a functional interface? My initial goal was, can I do it? And the answer was yes. I was able to design it, fit it into this compact package. The next goal was, can I build it? So I built it, had over a thousand parts in it, so it took a long time. I thought, if I can build it, then is it gonna sound good? Is it gonna sound as good as an original 808? And on the first prototype, the answer was, yeah, it's pretty good, like it's close. A couple of circuits were just not quite there, but I was surprised how the original sounds just leapt out of the first 880 prototype, like, you know, pretty much as close as I, I would want them to be to an original. Yeah, what is it that's difficult about cloning the 808? I mean, some sounds are harder than others, I think. So some of the other clones out there, I've had some in the shop to work on and to study. And I, I mean, I think any 808 clone can sound good. I think that there's just a couple of circuits that are just really hard to nail down. Uh, the clap is one of them. In my mind, the, the clap was the hardest circuit to get right. And I feel like the 880 is as close as any clone out there. I wouldn't be so bold as to say that it's perfect, but it's it's pretty good. Other things like, to me, the things like the toms and the cowbell and the snare, they're all pretty easy to get right. And I feel like other analog clones out there also do a good job of it. I think the trick is to get the original components. And then there are some tweaks required uh, because 808s have evolved over time because their sounds have changed over time because, uh, you know, resistors and capacitors over the years, their values change slightly. And some of the key sounds, especially the tones of a lot of the, the voices in an 808, they're exquisitely sensitive to component values. So if a resistor drifts by, a small percentage or a capacitor drifts by a small percentage over the years, that will change the fundamental tone that the circuit oscillates at. And so humans being so sensitive to pitch will really notice that if we're doing A-B testing. So I'm pretty convinced that 808s that were used on records in the early 80s, if you were to take the same 808 and record it now, it wouldn't sound like it did on its original recording.
I like working in the boutique realm. System 80 is really me spending maybe 40 or 50% of my time doing System 80 work. And then uh, our technician is really probably 30 or 40% time. So like System 80 doesn't even actually add up to like one person working full time. Every day begins with dropping the children off at school. So, so, and then doing the grocery shopping. So this is why it's really much a, a part-time affair because uh, I've, I still have, I've got three kids in school now. So I do the drop off and the pickup. And I like that balance. Uh, I don't want to get to the point where I can't manage, uh, you know, individual customer problems, customer support, stuff like that. Like I want to be able to do all that myself. I don't want to have to delegate it to somebody else. Really my favorite part is, is sitting down and doing the circuit board design, starting with a design, prototyping it, uh, honing it, getting it to where I want it to be, and sitting down designing the circuit board. Uh, and then I love panel design. I mean, the other one of my main interests in, in uh, instrument design is designing the user interface. Uh, that's something I really spend a lot of time on and I drive a lot of pleasure doing iterative changes to get the interface to where I want it to be. Um, so system 80 modules, I want them to be uh, as usable as possible in the compact Eurorack format. So uh, I make them a little bit bigger than maybe some people would want. You know, there's a lot of uh, HP pressure in Eurorack to get to make your modules narrower, push more functionality into fewer HP. Uh, I have the opposite instinct. I want to make modules wider, bigger, more more spaced out. And that partly comes from maybe I originally got into modular in the quarter inch 5U format. In contrast, your rack, either your rack feels comically small or 5U feels comically big, depending on what your perspective is. Um, so I, I, I want to create maybe some of the 5U experience in your rack with respect to user interface um, and even look and feel a bit as well. Where is System 80 going to go next? Really my dream has always been to build a polysynth. That's ultimately what I got into the design work for, was to, to design a, a digital analog hybrid uh, programmable polysynth. Um, and I actually got as far as designing a programmable monosynth uh, as a proof of concept. That's really what I'd like to get back to. 